Uh, thank you very much. In basing my topic, in looking at my topic on the challenges of women ordination, with partic particular reference to the Anglican Church, allow me to use to, uh, Kirinyaga Anglican Diocese to sample uh, this uh, topic. Now, let me say that as early as 1980, the House of Bishops in Kenya, the entire Anglican Church of Kenya, they had begun to discuss the ordination of women. And this was a follow up to the recommendation of the Rabbit Conference of 1978 that the member of that the member churches uh, were allowed to consider ordaining women. So the Rabbit Conference of the highest Anglican uh, body, that is the Lambeth Conference of 1978, 78, allowed members to consider ordaining women. Before 1978, no Anglican, no member of the Anglican Communion was ordaining women to priests. So although in 1980, the Kenyan Anglican province agreed in principle that women could be ordained, each diocese was to be autonomous in taking up the issue. Now coming now to Kirinyaga, Kirinyaga Anglican Diocese, the, uh, the then bishop, David Gitari, raised the issue of women ordination in four consecutive diocesan synods, or the big bodies. That is 1979, 1981, 1983, and 1986. The motion was turned down or defeated on the first three occasions, 1979, 81, 1983, because most of the male clergy opposed it. The motion was finally passed in 1986. However, women were not ordained immediately following this resolution that we can now ordain them. What was the reason? Now, the bishop or Vitare probably feared the general outcry from both ray persons and Kraji, accusing him of bulldozing the voting, though people did not subscribe to the dear 100%. This is reminiscent of a case in Mombasa Diocese, where in discussing the need to ordain women in 1989, a bitter exchange ensued, during which one man, Mr. Mr. Nelson uh, Zero of Gende Parish, uh, said that the church should not accept women as priests because the Bible was against it. And uh, Zero went on, as late as 1989, to quote several scriptures or scriptural verses, which indicated that women should keep quiet in the church and discuss matters concerning the church with their husbands at home. He was overruled and accused of undermining progress in the church. So it's kind of he was being told, look here, you are even quoting those verses which says women should keep quiet. But they are talking, they have been talking as lay readers, lay preachers. What are you saying? You are taking us backward. So he was overruled, but he put up a spirited fight to, uh, to show that uh, women should not be ordained in Mombasa and Diocese, just as those in Kirinyaga in 1979, 81, and 83 were doing before the motion finally passed. Um, it was told to stop, Zero was told to stop it because already the commission had already, already conducted a survey among the relevant dioceses and found 
uh, it on the contrary back to Kirinyaga diocese the debate was also received with much uh, anger bordering on mere physical fights as each group asserted its respective position it is no wonder that after a resolution was passed to ordain women the opponents of the motion went underground to poison people, especially Reiti, who had limited knowledge of the biblical message. Now, in 1992, six years after the ordination motion was passed in 1986, the bishop called the diocesan synod and expressed the need to ordain three women, at least for a start, three women. To his surprise, some members reacted as if they had not participated in the previous synod that had endorsed the ordination six years ago. Some argued for the postponement of the ordination. Others vowed that it would only happen over their dead bodies. In other words, or in short, there were mixed reactions. But the bishop, who refused to be influenced by patriarchal anthropology, stood his ground and acted as if he was only informing them of the date of ordination and he was not seeking their views as this was a decided case much earlier in 1986. To the utter surprise of everyone, two of the senior Karanji men who were actually at Deacon vowed never to allow it to happen. And they called, they called what was referred to as an illegal assembly of Karanji, which was attended by a good number of them. At this meeting, the two senior clergymen who opposed women ordination reportedly explained the problem and the danger that the bishop was taking or leading the church into and dismissed the characters that were going to be ordained as unworthy to be invited, invited to the sacred ministry. They vowed to get a court injunction, but before doing so, they called a press conference and externalized the bishop for his high-heartedness, according to uh, the vocabulary they used. They accused him of dictatorship and for pushing the issue of women ordination down the throats of the people or the Christians in general. They accused the bishop of reducing the delegates of the synod to mere rubber stamps that only adduced what he had already decided. This was given a wide coverage by the Kenyan daily press. However, three women were ordained before the opposers or the opponents were able to file a court injunction. In addition, Bishop Gitari demoted the dissenting clergymen immediately so as to stop them from growing influence. One wonders why the very people who had accused the bishop of dictatorship and labor stamping were so strong in favor, stronger in favor of everything else apart from this matter of women. It may show how devices the matter is and uh, how we take long to change. You still ask, why was it women ordination such a thorny issue? Even Roman Catholics today in 2023, they don't ordain. Why is it a thorny issue among churches? Now, even more surprising was that some senior female lay women were also opposed to women ordination. Look at it, where women now became their fellow oppressors where negative interiorization uh, inculcated in women has made them uh, think women couldn't do well, their fellow women couldn't do well. 
So they argued that it is against the natural law and harmony in society to elevate women to positions of power and influence, especially to the holy ministry of the church. They arranged that it is against the Bible and culture. And this now raises the following question. What is the difference between an, angry, an Anglican woman, Ray Reader, who robs like Kraji, and an Anglican ordained clergy woman? That's a question. Anglican women lay readers had been serving in the church for years and years. So you may ask, why was women ordination such a big issue? Okay, yet an Anglican woman or man lay reader serves the church like a priest in the absence of the priest. The only difference is an Anglican church lay reader cannot baptize or administer the Holy Eucharist. That's the only difference. The rest is the same. Another lesson learned from women, women opposing the ordination of their fellow women is that the society is in dire need of depatriarchalization. Yes, the society needs deconstruction in order to be reconstructed. Otherwise, depatriarchalization de without deconstruction is not enough. Therefore, it will require deep and intensive cleansing to rind itself of this monster since it is so ingrained in us from childhood. The way we are socialized about women and men informs how we behave in religious circles, political circles, social circles. Sociologically, we behave according to what has been internalized in us. We also need to appreciate that as a result of the, this social conditioning, some women have developed low self-esteem this harmonizes or resonates or is in continent with one scholar called Ugudipe Leslie. She has written what we call six, what she calls six mountains on the women's back in Africa. Six mountains on the women's back in Africa, where she identifies the fifth mountain as the woman herself. Is a mountain, a big mountain to a woman. A woman has uh, one major mountain, one major impediment to her own progress and development, herself, herself. Ogudipe uh, Risri um, rightly argues that women are shackled by their own negative self-image, by centuries of the interiorization of the ideologies of patriarchy and the gender hierarchy. And she goes on to say that their own reactions to objective problems therefore are often self-defeating and self-crippling. For some react with the fear, whereas more self-assertive action is needed. So the society is also to blame when we see women opposing one of their own uh, from raising to ec the acreons of society, it is the way we have socialized the girl child. Thus, this Kirinyaga case, case study, on the challenges of women ordination has quite a number of issues to learn, sociologically speaking, even from a religious perspective. Thus, since 1992, Kirenyaga Diocese has been ordaining women as clergy, and the numbers have increased significantly over the years. Some are archdeacons, some are rural deans, some have even attempted to be bishops or the, the final hands of the church. Something else we can say very quickly is all about the training of women uh, in the ordaining ministry particularly with reference to Kirinyaga. Since 1979, on the initiative of the then Bishop David Guitari, women have been trained in theological colleges alongside men and have been performing very well. After three years of uh, theological training, 
and certificate level at the local college, St. Andrew's, Andrews College of Theology and Development, Kabare, women were licensed as lay readers and not as clergy, while well, their male counterparts were straight away promoted to clergy, women would, be, would, ju would just get a license to practice as re reader, hal, not l, re reader. And since there was no female ordination for their male colleagues entering the whole order by being made Anglican deacons first, and then full priest. First is the stage of Anglican deacon. The next stage is full priest. Women would remain the same level as men or their male counter counterparts move to the higher levels of the ecclesiastical randa. After one year of probation, women were commissioned as deaconesses. Deaconesses is still a rate, a rare person, but that would create an impression they have also moved around that which was mere smoke screen because they are just a rate. There are many things they cannot do in the church. They are still barred by the rules of the church. After one year of probation, therefore, I've said women were commissioned as deaconesses, while men were ordained to priesthood. This meant that women remained lay people, not because of under training, but because they were female. They were thus posted in parishes to serve under their male colleagues as pastoral assistants. Sometimes they even had to serve under their male juniors, which caused a great deal of discontent. Some were well-trained or some well-trained women were posted at the diocesan bookshop, where they would be given the task of selling books after getting their diplomas in three years diploma in theology, or even degrees, they would be there selling books and stationery, just like any person who had never received any theological training. One wonders why train all that and you don't assign people to do the duties that appertains to that kind of uh, certificate they had gone to study for. But after 1982, women, women were now able to respond to the Great Commission and the Great Commandment of Love, just like their male con counterparts. Now, despite the clergymen and deaconesses having received equal training, some clergymen did not treat the, the deaconesses as colleagues and co-workers, but they saw them as subordinates. It was not unusual, for instance, for a deaconess to be asked by the male clergy to prepare tea or lunch during church council meetings, just like any other worker in the parish. This was blatant exploitation denying women their right to participate in the meetings, in the church parish council meetings, and re relegating, relegating them to the domestic domain. In other words, they were being reminded by their male counterparts, some of whom they beat in class, that remember you are just a woman. You was is always the kitchen. So you go prepare tea for us. I better be left with them lay men who are not trained in, uh, in theology in my parish council. Those are some of the things that were there. Now let's consider points or arguments that were used against women ordination. Now these arguments, as I got them from the synod books that are there at St. Andrews College, where they are stored very well in the archives, the, uh, were characterized, I would say that these arguments, which I got from synod books, were characteristically heated debates, as observed earlier. They were based on historical, biblical, cultural, and generic factors, and they were raised by both men and women. They were all using very tough arguments to say, women, you are just women. Yeah, nobody doubts that. But uh, the argumentation in general, as we shall see, was uh, missing somewhere. 
Now, some people contended that since the trend among missionaries, specifically the Church Missionary Society, was to train and ordain only men, not women, why should we now ordain women? Are we better than the missionaries? And are we preaching a different Christianity from the one preached by the European missionaries of the 19th century and 20th, 20th centuries who did not ordain women? Why change of direction? Such patriarchal arguments were based on ignorance of the fact that the church in Africa inherited an, an already gender biased tradition. Rather than deconstructing it, they wanted to sustain the status quo, which was a mistake. The argument fails to recognize that two wrongs do not make a right. Now, theological and biblical arguments were also used. And they were held, they were propounded that, they were propounded that women were not part of the Levitical priesthood in the Old Testament. Further, in the New Testament, Jesus only chose male disciples, and that Pauline theology does not allow women to speak in the church. Such arguments failed to recognize that the Bible should always be interpreted in terms of socio-cultural hermeneutics. Now, cultural arguments also played in. Another thing, cultural arguments that were advanced, the cultural arguments held that women were never leaders. They were never leaders in the traditional societies. And even those who were involved in the religious affairs were always beyond menopause, the age of 45. It is for that reason that some members of the Synod held that deaconesses should, should be ordained to diaconate 10 years after completing their ordination or their training at St. Andrew's College, Kabare, or wherever. Others recommended that only married women be ordained. Still, others held that ordained women should remain single, like the Roman Catholic nuns. In a later synod, some members openly admitted their fear that ordaining women would empower them to read even men, which is against the Roko Kikuyu traditional culture or the Roko Kirinyaga traditional cultures. Now, this fear of women ruling men was reinforced by the story of uh, the legendary, the, the legendary uh, chief Wangwa Makeri, the pioneer woman chief within central Kenya, who is reportedly, reportedly said to have ruled with a lot of brutality, especially towards men. Of her story, which, is, which was included in the Kenyan government school curriculum in the 1960s and 70s, uh, led people to think that she was that brutal as the first pioneer African woman chief, maybe in Kenya, we can say in Kenya. Scholars were taught lies, or students were taught lies about her, a pack of lies. Namely that Wango Makeli never sat on a chair, but during her chief's, chief's barazas, or chief's meetings, she sat on men's beds. Okay? Yeah, just to show how powerful she is as a chief, she mis misused her powers. This story was used to socialize school-going children and actually it was meant to warn them, to warn them that there is a danger of giving leadership to women. Take care. You give women power, they misuse it. They harass you, you men. They even harass you, you women, their fellow women. Be careful with a woman leader. That was a mistake. Uh, the story implied that women are always prone to abusing power, which is not evidential in tropical Africa. We have examples of men leadership and uh, women leadership like Silef 
Johnson in Liberia who brought Ebola down and even when COVID came she was there again to stop it in the same format she used when Ebola and uh, some few years earlier had attacked uh, the country and as the president Silev Johnson stopped it using the same communal or community-based approach to fighting uh, the, the, the pandemics in the so-called community health workers, use of community health workers. Everybody becomes a health worker. Or quite a number of local people uh, will be policing the society through medical uh, provisions because they are trained how to fight uh, such pandemics. So when COVID came, straightly after Silev Johnson and left as the president of Liberia in 2020, when it came in March, uh, 2020, there were already people who were prepared to fight uh, the pandemic as, as they had fought another pandemic like Ebola disease that had hit. So women have not been uh, uh, seen in tropical Africa as those who abuse power, rather as preservers of life. And even in Google Wadiongo's book, the main character is Nyawera, who is leading to preserve life and uh, that itself is symbolic speaking for the tropical Africa. The uh, Google's Wizard of the Claw is, is really showing the reality. No force and good in showing and mocking the society and helping us understand the society we are in. We see it as women who are doing great efforts, effort to save society. Now, this story was used to socialize school going children and therefore warn us. In any case, the prehistoric Kikuyu have, have a story that Kikuyu were at, were at one stage matriarchal, but shifted to patriarchal. After women turned ruthless in their leadership prowess, according to Jomo Kenyatta facing Mount Kenya. Uh, so all those could be used to show when women were ruling, when we, the community in central Kenya had a matriarchal was matriarchal before men over three women. Women were really harassing men to take care of domestic domain and they felt harassed through the organized coup. Let me explain. As a result, men met secretly to craft a coup that brought women down. And in this meeting, they conspired to impregnate all their wives. Of course, that is not very logical. All their wives. This was to ensure that they were physically weakened as men staged a coup d'etat, both at family and governance level. That is how the story goes anyway. According to this story found in the second page of Jomo Kenyatta's book, Facing Mount Kenya, men celebrated their victory. They vowed that they would never allow a woman to lead the communities of central Kenya. While the story was taught, to standard three children, or class three children, young people, in the Kenyan schools. It did not indicate the period that Wangu and Makeli lived, or even that time when women were brutal. But the stories could be compared, analyzed together. Women as matriarchal, uh, in the matriarchal society where they were leading. Women being brutal, again, during Wangu and Makeli's time. Of course, there were too much exaggeration. Yet it created an impression that the Wango lived before Christ or during medieval times, or even those women who are ruling the community. They it created an impression you could not understand. That went on to convince you that really women cannot lead in a society. For that reason, it influenced many school going children and socialized both girls and boys to hate, hate women leadership. Many questions must have crowded the minds of pupils as their teachers exaggerated the story of Wangu sitting on the backs of women, of men rather. This created poisons, uh, the runners against women leadership once and for all. What's more, if this story were combined with the story of the fall of man, the fall of humanity, recorded in, in the biblical book, Genesis 3, where another woman, Eve, allegedly played a big role 
in bringing Adam down by is is getting tempted by the serpent the serpent to eat the forbidden fruit a school going child would obviously come to the conclusion that women leadership was the worst thing to ever contemplate researchers in more recent times have been surprised to discover that Wangwa Makeri was just a colonial assistant chief who served under a man chief Karori Wagakure of the present day with other location of course it has been subdivided to many locations that is neighboring Muranga county which neighbors Kirinyaga county in fact the uh, Wangwa Makeri is reputed to be the first woman chief in Kenya she made history taking such a position at that time uh, around 19, 1900 when she was born 1861 and uh, taking that position mantle to pioneer women uh, leadership during in the colonial Kenya was in itself a sign of being assertive and convicted and bold and strong leadership people were fearing leadership including men but the wangu wa makeri was in a position to take it that should have been praised rather than used as a way of uh, uh, demeaning women it should have been used like the way we use the story of debora in the bible how she helped people to escape should have been used like great stories of ruth or stories of mary magdalene stories of sarome semedi should be used like great stories of mary the mother of jesus and other great women in, in the bible but in this case these kind of socializations those days when they were opposing women ordination uh, were used in a very negative sense and the whole generation was really misread now the reality is wangu wa makeri sat on evil doers in the society by administering justice to everyone on behalf of the appointing authority that is the colonial government she was not favoring men no women if you come to wangu wa makeri the chief telling uh, uh, the chief i slapped my wife two times how she you, you'd be allowed to explain it and she would listen to you but the punishments you would give you you never try to beat your wife again those days men were beating women the way they want like children even children would not be beaten when they grow up but a woman was beaten till she died you'd find a elderly woman crying because she was beaten by the husband and that was seen to be cultural and wangu was fighting such cultures that are inimical to the dignity of a woman in any case it has been established that she lived between 1865 and 1936 she died the other day chief wangu wa makeri should have been upheld as a fine example to support women on the nation not suppress it because she demonstrated that women are not as weak as they are typically portrayed it appears that she was a very 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 successful judge not going to law school but she was a great judge in listening a listening judge is a good judge she was also good in giving the punishment you deserve and she would tell her and guard uh, the, those who guarding the chief scaries to take care to ensure the person does the punishment punishment even if you are given a whole a whole five acres to cultivate as a punishment it would be fair for what you have done so she would settle domestic violence like a judge as we see even men battering becoming the vogue in central kenya one wonders could the return of wangu wa makeri as a judge help central kenya where men are being battered these days by women the story has now changed it is women getting battered battering women because uh, if, you know the law looks it is like if when a man is battered by a woman a man will not report but when to the police or the uh, t- uh, take the case to the court but if a woman batters her husband the husband will keep quiet to avoid shame or being mocked or laughed at why are you beaten beaten by a woman so that forces men to be silent and you see if wangu wa makeri were there 
she would punish those women who were battling, even pouring hot water on their drunkard husbands, their irresponsible husband, find irresponsible wives who beat them up when they are drunk, particularly when they are drunk. Or some weak men who are hungry, why they are hungry and weak is neither here nor there. Wangu Makeri would be a good judge. Even in the 21st century Kenya, even today, 2023, we need Wangu Makeri today more than yesterday. It is therefore unfortunate that the controversy of a women ordination in Kirinyaga, Kirinyaga Anglican Diocese, was wrongly informed by the story of Wangu Makeri, which was twisted to look different. Another argument that was used against women ordination in Kirinyaga Diocese is that women would cease to be traditional wives and mothers, which to some was against the role of nature. Yeah, it looks appealing, because really, if you're a man, you need to be a man. If you're a woman, you need to be a woman. I'd be happy for it. But then, saying that ordaining women would stop